If you take your Bibles, we're going to be reading chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. As you're turning there, let me just kind of paint a little picture in your mind, because the book of the Revelation was written for us to see God's Word from the perspective of where it comes from and where all of our lives are going if we're in Christ. And so what towers over us every day is the king that sits on the throne that our prayers go to, our lives are lived for, all of our cries for help go to, and everything that matters in life is going to be discerned by him when we someday stand before him. So that concept of the king that we worship, the Bible says that, that we are to begin a lifestyle as living offered sacrifices of worship to God. That, that is exactly what Romans 12 says. It's one of the key words for worship that's right in there about living sacrifices. So God wants us to start thinking of life in relation to that king. Now, now let me just describe before we read these verses. When we pray, every time we pray, you and I, when we offer our prayers, we pray to the throne of our hallowed father who is king of the universe. And that's where the prayer is delivered, in front of the throne of our hallowed Father in heaven that's seated on the throne. And when we have any kind of struggle, it's to the throne of the King of grace and mercy that we cry out and find help in time of need. But he's a king, and we're his subjects. He is king. We're his creatures. And when we pray... It's to him. And when we cry out, the, the response of grace and mercy to help us comes from that throne. Thirdly, when we serve, it's our king who tests all of our good works by his refining fire. And he's the one that passes out our rewards. It is, it is our king we are getting ready every day of our life to come and stand in front of and to offer our lives and to let him analyze how much of our life was lived that will make it through the fire because it was lived for his glory. And finally, when we worship, it's the throne of our God who is the king of the universe. The throne of our God that is surrounded by the countless numbers of the hosts of heaven where we are constantly being added to that circle around his throne. It is there that the worship we just offered arrives. And the worship we offer every day and moment of our life arrives. Where our worship arrives, if we're a true worshiper of the true God, we're going to arrive there too. And see, that's how important worship is. Because just like all through life where our worship is directed, shows where our eternal destiny is directed they're tied together. And the book of Revelation ties those two together. The worshiper and the king. The worship and the throne of God. And the worshiper and that location where our worship goes, we will go also. So we worship our king on the throne. And as we open the Revelation 4, we find that the last book of the Bible merges all this together. In fact, uh, uh, it's wonderful to see God giving us, especially in this age we live, pictures I mean, it's so neat that the book of Revelation, that's why most people don't, for centuries, haven't known what to do with it, because it's all written in pictures, and it's scenes, and it's graphic illustrations of the kind of worship that pleases God, of the kind of worship he seeks to see coming from our, and issuing and being produced by our lives. That's what the Lord wants, and it's a book of pictures. The only people who get to enjoy God forever are worshipers. The only way to become a worshiper is to be God's subject. Remember the king on the throne? The only people that are in his kingdom are the ones that subject themselves to him, that bow to him, that surrender to him, that fall before him. And, and those are the worshipers. So worship, salvation, is, is completely connected together, not only in the previous 65 books, but in the book of Revelation. A biblical theology of worship could be stated that we are true worshipers who serve the true God because we've bowed to him as king, and he's given us a new heart. He's given us the frequency 
He's given us the communication ability. He's given us the launching pad that we can be launching to him the worship that rises before him where we will someday follow that worship up because we want to forever adore, worship, and honor him. The whole book of Revelation revolves around the fact of seeing and responding to our God who is the king on the throne. The whole book is written about seeing and responding to him as king, the one seated on the throne. And Jesus gives us this last book to get us ready to meet and just fall bowing before him as king. And, And remember, the book starts with the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to give to his servants. You see, God gave Jesus the book of Revelation's truths to give to us, to get us ready, to let us see where we're going, and that's what we're going to do. Chapter 4, and as uh, you, you're there in the Bible, let's all stand. And as we stand, I want you to think about this. We're going to read the whole chapter, but I want you to think that you're in the throne room of the king of the universe. And as we read these words, I want you to think about the setting for where our worship goes. And if you're a true born-again worshiper, where all of your worship from the instant of salvation goes. And then I want you to think about what kind of uh, response once we're fully on earth tuned in to the worship of heaven, once we're fully offering ourselves as worshipers to the King of Kings, what kind of a gift in that moment when all of our hearts are united can we give him? And and it's going to be a moment where we worship our King. But just follow along and look at the scene. After these things, verse 1 of chapter 4, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here. I will show you the things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne. And he who sat there was like Jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and having crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceedeth lightnings, thunderings, voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had the face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures... Give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Did you know many years ago someone wrote words that they offered before the king on his throne? If you want to reach in front of you in the pew rack, find the the green hymn book, and we're going to sing number 10 to the Lord this morning. And the whole, now, now remember, you, you may have heard this in earlier days in your life, or you may know these words, but the idea of this hymn is that this is how we worship the King all glorious above and gratefully offer to him our adoration, our worship, our honor of him. So, so that's the backdrop. And as we sing it this morning, sing it like you're giving it as a gift. Because when you come before the Lord, he says, don't come empty handed. Give me something. And let's give him this hymn together this morning. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, it seems so far away 
so long from now that we're going to be there, especially the younger we are. It just seems like there's just more than we can comprehend before that day. But you've told us in Revelation that we're actually participating in reality when we offer that worship to you from every dimension of our life. And that worship you're collecting, that worship you are inhabiting. And the book of Revelation tells us that reality, the reality of eternity is that's what's going on. Worship and adoration, honor and glory to you. And so I pray that this service will be a time that your spirit can unhinderedly stir our hearts to what biblical worship is all about. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of sacrifice of self and of giving to you. And we are plunged in the most consumptive era of human history, it seems, the most self-centered. And we wish your spirit to stir our hearts and to break up the parts of our lives that aren't growing in worship to you. And we want all of us to be where you harvest the worship that pleases you and that you seek. Do that. Work in our midst. Stir our hearts. We ask in the name of Jesus and we pray for that. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, the scriptures tell us that the worship of the king of the universe is the message that this book of Revelation is all about. All 22 chapters, all 404 verses, every one of them are intricately woven together to show us this biblical theology of worship. And I just want to go through that with you this morning because the theme of the Bible, as well as the activity of heaven, as well as the very purpose that we were saved, is that we be worshipers of God. In fact, Jesus told the woman at the well in John 4, that God seeks that worship. The Apostle Paul says that, that we are those who worship God in the Spirit. When he talked about who's who, who are the real Christians, he said the real Christians, the real born again, the real saved, the real redeemed, are those who were redeemed and transformed and regenerated to worship God. In fact, Jesus, when he rebuked the devil, he said, you shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You notice that Jesus even flips our paradigm. We think we serve the Lord if we have time, we worship. And the Lord says, no, you worship me. And out of that worship will flow the service that I want. And so the center of everything to God, the activity of heaven, is that we worship and we bow and we adore our God. And what, he, what the Lord wants us to think about as we do that is that our God is the king of our life. And he's on the throne. And, and he is waiting from us, his subjects, from us, his creatures, from us, his children, that more and more of our life reflect that worship. He's looking for it, seeking it. Well, as we enter Revelation 4, we have to ask ourselves, then what is worship? I mean, it's used a lot. I mean, it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. I mean, people even worship humans. They worship heroes. They worship possessions. What, what, what is the definition that God wants us to operate on of what worship really is? Well, the simplest definition of worship that we can derive from God's word is worship is honor and adoration directed at God. I mean, now that's really simple. I mean, it, I, could, I could teach that down in the, you know, the, the gophers or whatever they're called, the little people in, in Word of Life. It's honor and adoration directed at God. Honor, everything we do, honor Him. Adoration, the intense, consuming passion of our hearts directed at Him. That's what worship is. And so that simple measure... If we use it, we find that God's word overflows with illustrations and explanations of how we can pour our honor upon the Lord. 
simple one. If you have my commands and keep them, he it is that loves me. In fact, the Great Commission ends with this word. Jesus said, our sole purpose for being left on earth is to go throughout the whole world and make disciples. And the way we know we're making disciples is that we're baptizing people. Jesus actually said that. It's wonderful to lead people to Christ. Jesus said they're not disciples if they don't get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It doesn't save them. It's their public declaration of allegiance to the king. See, baptism is big. You don't baptize babies. They don't know the king. You baptize subjects of the king. And you say, I am owned by, belong to him. And I'm publicly identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection. But after you baptize them, you teach them to observe all things that I've commanded. And I thought that was interesting. I punched in to my four gospels and I said, just circle. Actually, I didn't have them circle. I, I had them put a box around. In the New King James, put a box around every command that Jesus made in the gospels. Every time Jesus spoke in the command mood, the imperative, 1,000 different times he commanded. Did you know what those disciples were supposed to do? They were supposed to be portraying what Jesus said honored him. That his commands as king are what honor him. And so we are involved with the theme of the Bible being how to pour out our honor and our adoration to the Lord. Now, if you take the Bible and look at the word worship, you find that it's scattered all through the Bible. But what most people don't realize is there are seven different Greek words for worship and 10 different Greek words, 17 total Greek and Hebrew words that are translated by one English word, worship. And so as we look at the, the uh, Old and New Testament words for worship, uh, you could distill them down this way. In the New Testament, the predominant word, which is translated in the Old Testament uh, also, but it's a Greek word in the New Testament, is proskuneo. All those 17 words can be distilled down to basically two prime words, two most used words. And proskuneo is a common word most often used. It means to kiss toward. Uh, it's the idea of, of someone being so great that you, you don't even think that, that you deserve to get anywhere near them. And so you just throw them and, and, and focus on them and throw your adoration to them. And, and you try and get their attention and look at them and you just say, I, I, you're so great, but I just love you. And I just want to, and that's that kiss toward or bow down reverently, honoringly. It's a word for worship that, that speaks of adoration. It's very humble. It, it's, it's kind of backing up, throwing, kissing, bowing like that. That's the first word. That's the biggest word. It's the most frequent word. You know what the other one is? It's the word from Romans 12. It's very common too. Latereo is a very interesting word that means to give a gift as an act of worship. That's why Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your acceptable worship. There's that la toreo word right there. It's our reasonable service, King James puts it. It's the, it's the act of spiritual worship. And la toreo suggests rendering or paying or giving homage. So worship always conveys the idea of giving. You take all 17 words, seven in the old, 10 in the new. You add those 17 together and look at 17. Every one of them have a common denominator. They all speak of giving something. Worship is never getting. That's why angels, when humans try and worship angels other than fallen ones, the angels go, oh, oh no, we don't get. We just give. Worship, right down to the, the, the definition of the word, is always conveying the idea of giving something to God. The act of worship ascribes to God that he's worthy of us giving him adoration, that his worth is so great that we give him our devotion, that that his delight and desire that he has in our hearts causes us to adore him. Even if we aren't anywhere close enough to touch him, we just adore. You can feel the adoration welling up. That's the idea of worship. Although we may offer worship as a group, and this morning we had a worship service, but you know what? If you didn't individually contribute and give something, then you didn't worship. Attending singing or music or any 
concert is not worship unless you give. Worship is never getting. You know, our culture, we've really gotten it. People go to get, you know, this experience at a worship event without even thinking about what they're going to give. Because worship only is giving. And what's amazing is, in the Old Testament, God told his people that they should never come before him empty-handed. In fact, Deuteronomy 16, 16, where they're legislating coming up for the Passover, all the the three main festivals the Jews had to attend in Jerusalem, God says, don't even come if you're empty-handed. Don't come before me without bringing me something. Worship always is attached grammatically, syntactically, and, and in these pictures in Revelation, it's always attached to bringing and offering and giving something to the Lord. You know, modern worship often centers on feelings that worshipers hope to get. You know, they even rate it. Oh, it wasn't really that good, you know. It wasn't, you know, my tempo or my volume or my style or, you know, and it, I just, you know, I didn't get anything out of it. And, and that, that they aren't describing worship because worship is never getting Worship is always and only giving. And and worshipers that are true are givers. And whenever we talk about biblical worship, the first lesson is that worship can only be something we give to God. And so we should be very cautious about what we give. You know, we don't think anything of it. You know, nowadays, uh, people that are, you know, getting married, they register so we know exactly what they want. And we, you know, you can even check it off, you know, and look at the pictures and, and not give them something, you know, God forbid, give them something they don't want, you know. They might return it, you know. You know, God says, how much more when you come before the king? You talk about the ultimate gift registry. It's the word of God. And God says, I have, I have put down what I would like you to give me so that you know exactly what pleases me and what offerings I'm seeking from you and now I invite you to give. And that's the way that we approach God's word. Much of the modern confusion in the church is about this preoccupation by many people upon what they want to get from God. In fact, we have a whole dimension of Christendom, the health, wealth, prosperity. I mean, they come to church to get healthier, to get more prosperous, to feel better. And, and there's such a preoccupation that even the, the worship gets kind of diluted in this way, that it's, it's somehow, the, the worship is somehow with me getting something. Of course, I get great delight in pleasing God, but not a preoccupation of what God is going to give to me. And so the essence of worship is selfless giving. It starts with us giving ourselves as his servants, as his subjects. It continues when we so understand, kind of like to whom much is forgiven, the same loves much. The more we understand how much we're forgiven, the more we adore him. And then as as we have given ourselves and as we adore him, then we just want to give him anything that will please him. And, And that's you know, any material gifts always follow the the giving of ourselves. You know what what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8? He says, you know what marked the the sacrificial giving of the New Testament church? They first gave themselves. And then they gave their gifts. But they gave themselves. And the gifts followed. Because where where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And where your heart is invested in worship to God, your treasures are connected to it. And they follow and they flow. So, there's no subject more important to us as God's servants in worship. And worship of the true God is the mark of true believers. And those who live forever are those who have responded to the gospel. And those who respond to the gospel have become true worshipers. See, Revelation merges all this together. And it shows us that you will never be in heaven if you're not an on-earth offerer of a stream of worship. And where your worship is directed and going is where your soul will forever be. And it's marvelously connected. And it's a real challenge for us. Well, Revelation gives us what can only be called a theology 
of how to truly worship the King of Heaven. And so I just want to go on a little journey with you. Uh, go back to chapter 1 in Revelation, and I want to show you, uh, remember the gift list? I mean, what, how do we know it's going to fit God? You know what I mean? I mean, you wouldn't want to show up offering him something that wouldn't fit. What is fitting of God? Well, he, remember, Revelation is like pictures. And, and all the way through, it, it explains this theology of how to truly worship the King of Heaven. It portrays for us heavenly pictures of worship, of what God desires, of what God has ordained, of, of what God has sent as an instructive portrait. And I was trying to um, do something. I had to change something on my phone, and I could not figure it out. And I had to go to YouTube, and I watched the clip. And by the time I got done watching this clip, I didn't even know that that there was this little place you could poke and it would pop this little part out. And, and, and that instructive picture opened a whole, whole new dimension of being able to do things. Did you know, that's, what, that's why we read the Bible. I don't read the Bible because i got to check the box off. What a boring thing to do. Who would want to check off a box, you know, and just, uh, got to do my page for the day. It's like watching a clip that unlocks a whole, something you love, it unlocks a whole new dimension of that. That's what, that's what worshipers, that's how they read the word. It's the unlocking of the truth of the one that we love so we can understand him and, and, and know his plan and his desires. Okay, number one, true biblical worship, number one, in verse one, look at Revelation 1, 1, true biblical worship starts with the words God gave to us. You know, you know what an interesting little journey would be? To go back to that, uh, that old-fashioned hymn and notice, I, I was, because you know, I did it first service too, while you all were singing, I was looking to check out whether or not in every line I could see an allusion to a scripture. See, that's what these, these old hymns have. They, they write the hymn reflecting out God's word. Now, what's the first principle that the book of Revelation shows us. True biblical worship starts with the words God gave us. Look what it says in Revelation 1.1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation means the unveiling or the revealing of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Did you know that the Bible is the revelation God gave of Jesus Christ? He is the Word. He is the incarnate Word. He is the living and true word of God. And this book is the revelation of him. He is revealed in this book. So you know what the Lord tells us? True biblical worship starts with the words that God gave to us. In fact, in John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Truth. Thy word is what? Truth. The word of God is the gateway of worship. And the first thing God wants us to know is worship starts with the words that God gave to us. Here in Revelation 1.1, we see that the truth is based on the revealed word of God. Worship is word prompted. It's word based. Did you know you can sing a lot of worship songs and you can try your hardest and the only connection to the Bible is a connection to an application and sometimes quite distant, removed from the Word of God. But God says, worship that is acceptable to me is, is starting with the Word that I give because it has to be in spirit, that's with born-again people, but in truth. So first of all, true biblical worship starts with the words. God even wrote down the the Israelite worship in the, the hymns of the Psalms. He said, don't, don't make up your own. Here, this is what I want. I don't want self-styled. I want spirit prompted and energized. And what God can most use, especially in our worship, is his word because his word is alive and powerful. Secondly, look at verse 10. True biblical worship not only is starting with the word God gives us, but it is only for those who are in the spirit. Look at verse 10. John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. True biblical worship is only for those who are in the spirit. You have to be alive. You have to be regenerated to really worship. 
John was able to see God in his glory and worship him as king, all because of the power of regeneration, the indwelling Holy Spirit. He had the battery. You know, you can have the most powerful electronic gizmo, and if there's no power source to it, you're sunk. And, and if there's no energy source to make it operate, the energy source for the life of us as believers is the Spirit of God. And the only way that we worship is energized by the Spirit. The flesh doesn't profit anything. Paul says in Philippians 3.3 that those who are saved worship God in the Spirit. The, the, the conduit, the, the connection, the, the way that we mail or send, or whatever you want to call it, our worship to God. How it gets there is when it's in the Spirit. He's our connection. He's the one that, the conduit that connects us to God. Jesus said this in John 6, 63, the Spirit quickens, but the flesh profits nothing. Only spiritual worship prompted by the Holy Spirit can please God. Not self-generated, fleshly induced in fact, Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, and, and she was part of the Samaritan worship. And you talk about ex excited worship. It was very excited. But the Lord says, nope, nope. Salvation is of the Jews. You've got to use the method I told them, not your own. And she was offended. And he said, you know what? It's God that's offended by your self-styled worship. It has to be in the spirit, and it has to be in truth. And so true biblical worship is only for those in the spirit. Look at verse 17. Here's another wonderful picture God gives us about true biblical worship. It involves seeing and falling before Christ. See in verse 17, when, when John saw him, he fell. True biblical worship involves seeing, and once you really see Christ, it causes a response. It causes us to bow before him, to fall before him, to realize that, that he is everything and I am nothing. There's a response. That's why, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, Philippians 3.3. 3. We're smitten because he is so great. When John turns and sees Jesus as the risen king of kings, he falls before him, verse 17. John fell before Jesus just like Peter fell before Jesus. Do you remember in Luke 5, verses 8 and 9, Peter was a great fisherman. I mean, that was his career. He had that down. And he, had, he was coming in in his boat, and Jesus was on the shore, and Peter had been out fishing all night long, and, you know, Mr. Expert Fisherman had caught nothing, and Jesus, before he gets to shore, he says, hey, Peter, throw your nets, plural, Luke 5, Throw your nets on the other side of the boat. Peter, only Peter. You know, he's the one that said, not so, Lord, you know, in, in Acts. He really had a problem with being told what to do. And he said, I fished all night. I know what I'm doing. But if you ask me to, and it says in Luke, he threw his net one. He had a whole boat of them. Through one, poof, the boat starts tipping over. Jesus had redirected every fish in the whole Sea of Galilee into his net. And, and what it says is this, and I'll read it to you in chapter 5 of Luke. It says, when Peter saw it, when he saw that, that swirling mass of fish right next to the shore, there's no way that they could be stacked up that deep right next to shore. It says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the fish. Peter fell in his face, just like John did, when he saw Jesus for who he is. Did you know the purpose of worship is not to be entertained and to rate it and to... It's to come to the place, because it's based on truth, and because we're filled with the Spirit, that we come to the place where we see Jesus. And at that moment when we see him, we, our, our human, our fleshly abilities, we just melt before him and bow in our hearts. That's true biblical worship. It involves seeing and falling before Christ. You know, John fell before Christ 
in Revelation 1.17, kind of like all the disciples did on the boat. Do you remember in the book before Luke, in the book of Mark, chapter 4, Jesus had had a big day and he had done all this healing and feeding. And he gets in the boat and he says, could you guys take me to the other side of the Sea of Galilee? So he gets there and as soon as they started, he curls up, finds a soft spot, lays his head down, goes to sleep. And you know, if you read the text, it says that this storm, the Greek word is basanadzo, and it said that the waters were tormented. I mean, the waters were just, every bit of it was just, what it was is the devil saw Jesus asleep and said, wow, we can get rid of him. He's going to drown him. We don't need soldiers. We'll drown him. And, and so he sent this horrific storm to drown Christ. And it reminds me, Bonnie says, honey, you can sleep through anything. Why well, say it's just like Jesus, you know? He slept through the storm. And so Jesus is sound asleep in this horrible storm, and disciples are shaking him like this, and it says they feared. They feared the boat was sinking. They woke him up. And so look what it says. It says, in, and I'll just read it to you in Mark 4. It says, he arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you fearful? How is it you have no faith? Verse 41, and then they feared exceedingly. They were exponentially more afraid after he did that than before when they were in just the storm. How would you like to, to have the one who talks to the wind and the waves and the ocean and the storm around you in your boat? I mean, they were ready to jump out of the boat. They were scared. It says exceedingly fearful. They bowed before him. True biblical worship involves seeing and falling before Christ. Here's the last one. Look at chapter 2. And I want to show you in verse 1 of chapter 2, the, the fourth point, true biblical worship is always being watched and tested by Jesus. Now, when we lived up in the... Uh, in New England, they're really big on water, purity, and everything. You know how New England is. They lead the country in all their green stuff. And, and I remember that we used to get regular reports on the district water condition and how many parts per million and billion and trillion there were of everything. I thought it was so funny when one of my friends worked for the water department. They went up, you know those big tall water towers? He went up in there and looked. There were six raccoons that were bleached white skeletons up in that thing. I wonder how many parts per million of raccoon we got, you know, in our water. But, you know, I was reading the report, and they were, they were really into testing the water and giving little reports. Well, look at chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the golden lampstands, I know your works. Keep going down to verse 23. After he says that, little harsh opener in verse 23 I kill her children with death and all the then it says and all the churches will know now here here's the testing that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and I give to each one of you according to your works true biblical worship is always being analyzed and tested by Jesus Christ it doesn't matter what we get out of it it completely matters what he gets out of it. He's testing, sampling, seeing. If we're worshiping in spirit, if we're in step, in sync with his spirit, if we're walking in the spirit, if we're more of him and less of us, and if the content of our worship is in truth, he's sampling it all the time. And Jesus wants us as he examines our hearts and minds, he walks about as we gather. And he says, I want all the churches to know I am the one searching your hearts and minds. And I'm going to give you according to your works. And, and we were created for good works. We were created to offer good worship. And he's sampling it to make sure that it's pleasing and acceptable to the Father who sits on the throne and to whom all glory and honor is supposed to hallow his name. So, true biblical worship flows from the word. It's only generated in the spirit. And that worship causes, if it's true, us to see Christ. And when we see him, we're undone. And we fall before him 
And we say, I want, as you test my worship rising before you, I want it to be pleasing to you. That's why Revelation was written. And that's what we're here on earth to do. Let's stand as we close. And as we stand, I'm going to pray in just a moment. You and I were created to worship God. That's the reason for our existence. And did you know, every time we have a service here, there are those who are further down the road than others in the faith. And those godly men and women always stand here at the end of the service to help you with whatever it is we're talking about. And if you just want to kind of restart the life of worship, if you want to restart making sure that that you are in the Spirit, or you want to restart getting into the how-to clips on how to just open up more of your life to worship, they would love to pray with you. That's why they're here, the elders and the Titus two women. But if you just want on your own this week, when it comes time for your Bible reading, you just open up and say, Lord, I want to worship you. I want to honor and adore you. I want to do it in spirit. So I ask for your spirit to fill me in. If there's anything in my life that's grieving, quenching you, cleanse that away, I repent of it. Now give me some truth. And I'm just going to keep reading. It doesn't matter what my little chart says. I'm just going to keep reading. And it might be the first verse, it might be the 50th verse, until there's a truth that you energize by your spirit in my life, in my heart, and I can give it back to you. That's life that God left us to live. Let's bow for a word of prayer. I pray for a lifestyle of worship to be each of ours. First, I pray that, that the truly born-again ones that are assembled here today would realize that those who were circumcised in the heart by you, Christ Jesus, are to worship you and rejoice in you as we'll do tonight around your table and confess the wonders of our salvation. And we're to have no confidence in the flesh. I pray that we would measure every time we say we're worshiping to see whether or not we're giving something to you. What you ask for, what pleases you. We ask that for your glory. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.